so welcome back again uh, we have talked about the constraints previously so I'll just skip to the next slide so uh, there are four types of constraints uh, written by David Norman which is that the constraints are powerful clues limiting the set of possible actions the thoughtful use of constraints in design lets people readily determine the proper course of action even in a novel situation now Norman breaks breaks down the constraints into four subcategories these aren't just about preventing wrong input but they are also about ensuring the correct input they are about making sure that the user knows what to do next now the first constraint is the physical constraint. The physical constraint are those that are literally physically preventing you from performing the wrong action. Now if you have a power outlet at your home, if that's a 3 pin power outlet, it makes you understand that you cannot put a 2 um, kind of a uh, two power socket into the three power outlet it tells you with its shape similarly if you have a two pin power outlet then it tells you that you cannot insert the three pin power plug so that's a kind of a physical constraints which is um, available in your everyday life so uh, basically a three pound plug for example can one uh, can only physically be inserted in one way which prevents mistakes USB sticks can only be physically inserted one way all the way but the constraint does not arise until you have already tried to do it incorrect, incorrectly. You will know when you, have, when you will try it. So that's the problem. That's, uh, that's actually the constraint which is associated with the physical aspect. Now the second constraint which Norman tells is the cultural the cultural constraints uh, with the cultural constraint there are rules there are rules that are generally followed by different societies like facing forward on escalators or forming a line while waiting in designing we might rely on these but we should be careful of in cultural differences so of course if uh, there are cultural norms that uh, let's say uh, you cannot uh, use or you cannot drink someone else's water. It's in some way a cultural norm in some countries that if somebody has drink drank the water, you cannot drink in the same what you say is utensil. So the uh, there are other cultural differences as well. It's not like I am signifying something but it's a reality that there are some cultural indifferences and we have to consider these cultural differences within the design of our interface that it should not be uh, it, it should not work as insensitive to one's culture and uh, signify another so it's like we have to consider all these aspects when designing the interface the third is the semantic constraint. So semantic constraint are constraints that are inherent to the meaning of a situation. They are similar to affordances in that regard. For example, the purpose of a rear view mirror is to see behind you so therefore the mirror must reflect from behind. It's inherent to the idea of a rear view mirror that it should reflect in a certain way. In the future, that meaning might change autonomous vehicles might not need mirrors for passengers so the semantic constraints of today might be gone tomorrow the fourth one and the last one is the logical constraint so logical constraints are things that are self-evident based on a situation not just based on the design of something like a semantic constraint but based on the situation at hand for example imaging Imagine building some furniture. When you reach at the end, there is only one hole left and only one screw. Logically, the one screw left is constrained to go in the one remaining hole. That's a logical constraint. Now, let's see 
we have this kind of a constant let's see we are sitting in a car let's look at this example further now in this car you can to set the time on your time Subaru settings. begin on the guidance screen press and hold the enter button to go to the settings screen from there toggle to time date with the up down buttons then press enter using the up down buttons again select the digits you'd like to change then press enter then select the correct digit and press enter repeat this process for each number you'd like to adjust you can also choose between a 24 hour clock or a 12 hour clock after you've correctly set your date and time select set and press enter now look at this video and you will see that a person is changing the time and date settings in his car while resting it's like the car is not moving now if the car is moving this car will disable all the controls which sets the date and time now the thing is that is it is a kind of a constraint and this constraint will not allow you to change time and date while you are driving the car so it's a kind of a constraint in terms of safety so the constraint is not in the service of usability here but in the service of safety because you cannot use that particular setting while driving the car so the car is made less usable to make it more safe which again defies the rule of usability at altogether so again this is the same thing which we discussed in our previous series of this lecture that it depends on you you have to choose that which principle you have to follow in a certain way to make the interface more useful rather than usable sometimes usable sometimes useful it depends on the conditions the logical constraints the semantic constraints the cultural constraints and the physical constraints now another uh, aspect and the design principle is the tolerance so we can't constraint away all errors all the time though so there are two principles for how we deal with errors that do occur feedback and tolerance Tolerance means that user shouldn't be at risk of causing too much trouble accidentally. So, if uh, let us see what Nielsen says about it. So, users often choose system functions by mistake and will need a clearly marked emergency exit to leave the unwanted state without having to go through an extended dialogue, support, undo, and redo. Similarly, Lockwood says that the tolerance principle, the design should be flexible and tolerant, reducing the cost of mistakes and misuse by allowing undoing and redoing while using preventing errors wherever possible. Now you can see that both of them are focusing on this redoing and undoing concept. And this has also been highlighted in Dick's et al. So for Dick Settle, this is the principle of recoverability. Now Nielsen's definition here is more interested in supporting user experimentation. The system should tolerate users poking around with things that enhances the principle of discoverability because if the user feels safe experimenting with things, they are more likely to discover what's available to them. Now here, this maze says that the design minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions now here the constantine and lockwood and mace's um, definition or principles are more about recovering from traditional mistakes this has been also highlighted by one of other researchers which is jeff raskin that says that a computer shall not harm your work or through inactivity allow your work to come to harm now here Jeff Reskin poses this as a more humorous law of interface design. So we first have to make sure that the system prevents the user from doing too much damage accidentally either, either by uh, constraining them away from making those mistakes 
or allowing an easy way to recover once those mistakes have been made. This refers to the tolerance level. Now, in this case, uh, let's think of an example. So, uh, let's say sometimes it happens that you accidentally uh, or you are working on a computer and your child just comes around and powers off the button of your PC. Now, Microsoft Word has one way auto save option. Now, in this case, what happens is that there are some um, checkpoints where your documents get auto saved irrespective of the like consequences what your child has done. Now, of course, there will be some information which would be lost, but there would be much of that which would be recovered by that particular option. So, what it does is it allows the user to basically make mistakes but of course there are some redundancy checks and there is uh, some consequence to it but of course some information would be retained other uh, there are other applications which could support this tolerance example and i um, presume that uh, in the next report in the next assignment report you would provide some of the more sophisticated examples for this tolerance and with uh, respect to your application which you are designing now feedback is another um, aspect of the tolerance the system should also give plenty of feedback so that the user can understand why the error happened and how to avoid it in the future so Norman says that feedback must be immediate, feedback must also be informative, poor feedback can be worse than no feedback at all because it is distancing, distracting, uninformative and in many cases irritating and anxiety providing. Now we have already uh, like uh, discussed about the feedback in detail in our lectures, feedback cycles and we know that how important the feedbacks are. So, the Norman signifies that particular importance of the feedback. So, the Norman, if anything, has ever described the classic Windows blue screen of death, it's this. It's terrifying, it's bold, it's cryptic, and it scares you more than it informs you. And we do not want that particular feedback. Now, here, Jacob Nielsen says that the error messages should be expressed in plain language. No quotes precisely indicate the problem and constructively suggest a solution. Now, this one, uh, the blue screen of death in Windows, which is the new one, is compliant with this that the error messages should be expressed in plain language, which it does. Note this is tight relationship with the re recoverability. Not only should it be possible to recover from an error, the system should tell you exactly how to recover from an error. That's feedback in response to errors. Lockwood and Constantine uh, say it as the feedback principle. The design should keep users informed of actions or interpretations, changes of state or condition, and errors or exceptions through clear, concise, and unambiguous language familiar to users. Now, this is somewhat related to the Jacob Nielsen's one that it should be explained in a plain language. Again, the old Windows blue screen of death doesn't do this very well because the language is not familiar, it's not concise and it does not actually tell you what the state or condition is. The new one does a better job of this. Notice as well that the Norman, Constantine and Lockwood are interested in feedback more generally, not just in response to errors. That's so fundamental that we have an entire lecture on feedback cycles that really is more emblematic of the overall principle of feedback. Here, we are most interested in feedback in response to errors, which is very important concept on its own. Now, the last one is the documentation. Finally, Nielsen has one last heuristic regarding user error documentation. I put this last for a reason. One goal of usable design is to avoid the need for documentation altogether. We want users to just interact naturally with our interfaces. 
In modern design, we probably can't rely on users reading our documentation at all unless they are being required to use our interface altogether. I ask you, how many documentations have you read or how many license agreements have you read while installing a software? Have you read any documentation for Microsoft PowerPoint? Have you read any documentation for uh, Microsoft Word? Or have you read any documentation recently for any software? Let me know in your assignment section. So I feel modern design as a whole has made great strides in this direction over the past several years. Nowadays, most often when you use documentation online or wherever you might find it, it's framed in terms of tasks. You input what you want to do and it gives you a concrete list of steps to actually carry it out. That's a refreshing change compared to older documentation which is more dedicated to just listing out everything a given interface could do without any consideration to what you were actually trying to do. Now here the Jacob Nielsen says even though it is better if the system can be used without documentation, it may be necessary to provide help and documentation. Any such information should be easy to search, focused on the user's task, list concrete steps to be carried out and not to be large now documentation is still very important but when the affordance fails and when the mapping fails and when the simplicity and discoverability fails then documentation is the one which actually covers all of these aspects like it will make you understand the discoverability of that particular option it will be simple because it is not of course uh, in the everything is not in the interface so you have to again walk a thin line between the discoverability and simplicity and it will help you in creating affordances with the interface and also in mapping what the function would do to the real world now uh, let us uh, revisit what we have explored in this lecture so we have talked about a bunch of different design principles in this lecture how these design principles apply to your design tasks will differ significantly based on what area you are working on so if you are working on ai applications or if you are working on a simple um what you say is responsive website or you are working on a kind of a feedback based uh, a question answer chatbot or you are working on any other application it will significantly differ uh, the design principles will significantly differ of course in gestural interfaces for example constraints presented a big challenge because we can physically constraint on users movement we have to give them feedback or feed forward in different ways for instance in virtual reality or augmented reality it is very difficult because if you are playing a pokemon game if you are playing a pokemon game the feedback is very important because if you are uh, playing pokemon and you are entering in the traffic area it would be very difficult to actually play the game and keep yourself safe from the running traffic so it's important to provide the feedback in that scenario so if we are working in particularly complex domains, we have to think hard about what simplicity means. If the underlying task is complex, how simple can and should the interface actually be? Now if you have a kind of a very complex environment, like let's say you have um, let's say you have a kind of a recording software, OBS. Uh, Currently, I am recording my lecture using open source broadcasting software. But if you have come across uh, OBS, if you have come across Filmora, if you have come across that software, there are so many options which are a kind of uh, displayed in a modular sense. So these are some complex domains and you have to think hard that how you can make those softwares or how you can make those interfaces simple while keeping the underlying task complex. We might find ourselves in domains with enormous concerns regarding universal design. If you create something that a person with a disability can't use, 
you risk big problems both ethically and legally. So you have to brainstorm about these problems and its solution based on the application you choose for your mini project. So um, you uh, for the assignment what you have to do is you have to make an assignment and list out the design principles and heuristics which we have discussed in this class and explain that what kind of heuristics or what kind of principles you will try to embed in your application and why and how it will fulfill the uh, what you say is the essence of that design principles and heuristic in your application how it will serve its purpose so there are other sets of principles as well now this is the table which uh, tells you that which design heuristic or principle belongs to a particular author like Don Norman Jacob Nielsen constant and Lockwood and universal design so I've attempted to distill the 29 combined principles from Norman Nielsen Constantine Lockwood and the Center for Universal Design into just these 15 note that there are more recent additions norman has one more principle which is conceptual models that's actually one of the lectures in our course that is mental models these are not only the four design principle there are several more for example dix finlay and abord and wheel propose three categories of principles learnability for how easily a user can grasp an interface flexibility for how many ways an interface can be used and robustness for how well an interface gives feedback and recovers from errors we will talk about learnability principles when we will discuss about mental models now another which is Jill had Gerard Powell's has a list of principles for cognitive engineering aimed especially at reducing cognitive load her list is in particularly useful applications for data processing and visualization in the human interface In the human interface, Jeff Raskin outlined some additional revolutionary design rules. I wouldn't necessarily advocate following them, but they are interesting to see a very different approach to things. In computer graphics principles and practice, Jim Foley and others give some principles that apply specifically to 2D and 3D computer graphics. Finally, Suzanne Winschank and Dean Barker have a set of guidelines that provide an even more holistic view of interface design including things like linguistic and cultural sensitivity tempo and peace and domain clarity even these are only some of the additional lists there are many more that i encourage you to look into so let's conclude uh, this lecture so in this lecture we have tried to take the various different lists of usability guidelines from different sources and distill them down into a list you can really work with so we combine the list from Don Norman, Jacob Nielsen, Constantine and Lockwood and Ronald Messon into 15 principles. Now remember these are just guidelines, principles and heuristics. None of them are holy grails or unbreakable rules. You have to consider all of these principles while also considering that whether any one of them can harm your interface in such a way that the users won't use it again. Like the one I explained while maintaining the consistency in Microsoft Visual Studio. So you will often find yourself wrestling with the tensions between multiple principles. There will be something cool you will want to implement but only most expert users will be able to understand it. Or there might be some new interaction method you want to test but aren't sure how to make it visible or learnable to the user. These principles are things you should think about when designing, but they only get you so far. You still do need finding, prototyping and evaluation to find out what actually works in reality. Now uh, please uh, let me know your comments uh, about the video lectures if you want me to kind of improve in some aspect the video lectures please let me know your feedback is important here and also uh, kindly let me know about the material which I am providing you can uh, actually uh, 
get the material from the LMS account or I will also share the Google Classroom ID in the live session so you can actually uh, get the material from Google Classroom as well so I'll upload the lecture slides and I'll also share the links to these videos as well and also I'll um, share some what you say is um, guidelines for the mini project there and some uh, like notices which I want to share something if I want to share something with the students I'll put a digital notice in the Google Classroom or in the LMS so I'll encourage you to visit the LMS and the Google Classroom regularly for the stuff which I am going to upload for the question and answers please uh, select or please note the slide number and let me know the slide number in the live session so we'll discuss it in more detail of for what aspects you do not understand and also we'll discuss that in our native language so it will be easier for you to grasp the concept if you have not understood it in the english language in this video lecture so stay safe and uh, please do provide your feedback thank you